Good morning. Welcome to Calvary. Thank you all for coming. Uh, if you don't know who I am already, my name is Nate Anderson. Uh, I'll be filling in for Jim today. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. We'll be reading in John 5. So if you have a Bible, um, please open to John 5. And if you don't, there's some Bibles back there. Um, today we're going to be going over a... Um, a lesson. It's going to be a, a miracle uh, Jesus performed. It's going to be on um, the name of the lesson will be Hope for Healing. So we're going to be talking about um, healing and hope and what that looks like in our lives. Um, so let's get right into it. Starting in verse 1 in John chapter 5, it says, After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Um, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of, of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there, or lying there, and knew he had already been a long time in that condition, he, he had said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day, so the Jews were saying to the man who, had, who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered, he answered them, He who had made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who, had healed, who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have, done, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he, had only, he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So, first off, we see this is a, a story, a miracle um, that Jesus had performed. Um, and it kind of paints this picture, this sets the scene of this pool that all these sick and ill people were sitting at. And it says there's five porticos, meaning it's, a, it's an Italian word or Latin word for... Um, for porch. So it's five different areas full of sick people, and we're going to be focusing on one sick, ill, uh, the lame man, the paralytic, that we'll call him, who had been there perhaps the longest for 38 years. Um, it also says that um, the waters were stirred up by an angel of the Lord, meaning God was working through this pool to heal people. Um, and I was talking to um, a lady from first service, and she had asked, like, how do they know when the pool would be stirred up, like if it was raining or if it was windy, like would they be on edge? Like, oh, is it, is it bubbling now? Is it time to get in and uh, get healed? So um, it says that every so often through the seasons, um, so maybe once or twice a year, um, the angel would come down and stir up the waters. And so that's, this is what this man was seeking, um, was to get in the water and heal. So before we unpack all of this, um, if you're taking notes, I'm going to break it down into three main sections, the paralytic, um, Jesus, and then the Pharisees, and how they all um, act in this event that occurred. Um, and in each uh, main section will be three points that we'll be covering. So um, the first person we'll be focusing on is the paralytic. Uh, and the first point is that we see the paralytic was desperate. Um, he was there for 38 years, but he was lame. So uh, the healing that was there right in front of him, he... He couldn't access because he was unable to move and he wasn't able to get help because um, 
who would help them if they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to get in there first. Um, so first, if you're, if you're taking notes, first point is paralytic was desperate. He was there for almost 40 years. Um, next, we see that the paralytic was hopeful. Um, this is the most important part that we'll be touching back on throughout um, the study, but we can assume that he had seen healing take place at this pool, um, that they, they've seen um, the, the water stir and people have got in and perhaps even left the area healed. Uh, so his hope was that he could get in and then get healed as well. Uh, he could have given up. He could have, um, I mean, he can't go anywhere, so I mean, he's there for the long haul. But uh, we can assume that he has witnessed healing at that pool and he wants to have that as well. So he had been holding on to hope for almost 40 years. So a verse that pops out at me or that I came to mind when I was reading this was Isaiah 40, 31. It says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Um, so in this translation, it says those who wait on the Lord um, will gain new strength. In other translations, it, um, it says hope. So those who hope on the Lord, or hope for the Lord, um, they'll gain new strength. Uh, so just like this man hoped for 40 plus year, or 38 years, Almost forty-eight, or almost forty years, um, he was able to hold on to that hope for that long. Um, so the man waited and hoped. So hold on to hope. Um, we came across a, a quote from Greg Laurie that he has used multiple times on different occasions and uh, sermons and lessons uh, on hope. He says we can live forty days without food, three days without water approximately eight minutes without air. However, we can't live a second without hope. We can't live a second without hope. Hope is just that important. Um, And this man had hope in this healing uh, for 38 years. So the paralytic was desperate. He was hopeful. um, But he was obedient, ultimately. And because he was obedient, that also showed his faith in this healing and uh, what Jesus told him to do. In verse 9 it says, Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. So not only immediately did he get healed, but he also did what the Lord told him to do. The Lord gave him, or Jesus gave him a command and he did it right away. And he, he did what he was told. Now reading this, uh, wise words came to mind from my, my father uh, time and time again, he would ask us to, you know, do chores or whatever it may be, and we'd say, "Oh, just five more minutes, or give me a second, I'll do that later." And he would always say, "Delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience." And that stuck with me, which is good; those were wise words. Um, but his obedience, this man, this paralytic, his obedience, his immediate obedience showed his faith. In those words, he, he could have argued, he could have said, that's impossible, I can't stand, I'm lame, there's no way, you, you're just saying I'm healed, how could I believe you? But instead, he, he's immediately um, obedient, thus showing his faith in, in Christ, even though he doesn't know who he is yet. Um, so he, he, had, he had a desperation, he had hope in this healing that he, he needed so badly and he wanted um, and ultimately, he was obedient, and he showed his faith through this. So we have this man who's been waiting for healing, waiting for something, waiting for someone to come into his life, and uh, Jesus had that something, had that missing part for him, and unexpe- un- unexpectedly came into his life um, and healed him, gave him what he needed. And so now we'll be focusing on Jesus and how he acted in this, uh, what role he played. So... First point in Jesus' section, he, he knows. Jesus knows conditions. He knows afflictions. Um, it says that uh, in verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been a long time in that condition, um, he, he said to him, do you wish to get well? So without even meeting this paralytic, this, this man with this affliction, he already knew who he was. He knew how long he had been there. 
And this is comforting. I find comfort in this, and uh, I assume you would too. Uh, reading this part of the story reminded me of an earlier story in John, uh, the book of John. Uh, you can turn there if you like. It's John 1, 48, 49, but I have it uh, for you. And the reason it might be sticking in my brain is because I share a name with the, the man in the story. But it says in verse 48, uh, Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And verse 49 says, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Um, so this story, uh, this had happened after um, Jesus was performing some other miracles. And before Philip introduced Nathanael and Jesus, Jesus was like, I already know who you are. I've seen you, even though Nathanael didn't see Jesus and didn't talk to him. And so this right then and there, Nathaniel could say, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God, because you know me. And so because of this, we know that Jesus knew this sick man. He knew his desperation. And because he knew this desperation, he had healing for him. So the next point we have is after Jesus knows, Jesus commands. He commands healing. So this is a, this is a lesson on hope for healing, but... It's apparent in our lives that God doesn't always heal physically. Um, but he does promise spiritual healing. And he promises spiritual healing now. Um, physical healing is, um, of course, in the Lord's will, and we can pray for it. But it's promised later when, um, of course, when we spend eternity with him after death. But for now, spiritual healing is what is promised now. Uh, James 5.15 illustrates this, and it says, And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Uh, So this this verse is just a testament to how we're promised that that washing of our heart, that that healing of our soul. If we have sins, we just come to him in faith, and um, we'll be washed clean of them. And so a miracle has happened in this story of physical healing. And uh, this, I have a miracle in my early life uh, is kind of similar um, in that when I was almost two years old, I had uh, two two holes in my heart, to put it simply, and they had to perform open heart surgery on a little baby. And I know that my parents prayed and prayed, uh, asking for healing and deliverance, and through faith and through the grace of God, and was delivered through that. Um, and to this day, we, we still um, call it a miracle. We see it as a miracle. But just like God worked through that pool to heal people, God can work through other things in our lives today, like those doctors and the equipment they use to keep me, um, keep me going. Um, and uh, it's just a miracle in my life as opposed or in parallel to the miracle in this story. My family, I, don't, I can only imagine how much they prayed in faith and how, um, how many prayers are lifted up to um, ask for healing and deliverance. Um, but the way that the, before we get to the third point on Jesus, we'll be jumping into the Pharisees and how they acted and how, what role they played. Um, and the way they responded to this miracle, um, it's pretty interesting. They, in verse, in verse 10, it says, So the Jews were saying to the man who is cured, it is the Sabbath and is not permissible for you to carry a pallet. Um, so they were being nitpicky in their judgment. And uh, first point of the Pharisees is that the Pharisees were legalists. They were being legalistic. They're saying you can't, you're technically moving property on the Sabbath. Why, why would you be doing that? So I can only imagine if I got healed and I, I'd come out of the hospital um, all closed up, stitched up, healed, and someone said, oh, you can't, you can't walk freely. You can't, um, you can't be healed. You can't um, do what you haven't been able to do. So they're basically telling them you can't walk, you can't move right now, you have to wait. Um, how silly would that be? So that um, the Pharisees were legalists, but it, it boils down to one thing, and that's the second point on the Pharisees, that they were jealous of, of Christ, of God. Um, of the power he had. And so we have this situation of ability versus non-ability. Jesus was able to heal this man, and the Pharisees were not. 
Um, and so ultimately he's more powerful than them and they couldn't have that. And verse 12, 16, and 18, there's instances of uh, this evidence of them being jealous in verse 12 saying, um, who is the man who heals you? So they want to know who did this. And then in 16, uh, they were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And then 18, they ultimately seek to kill him, um, which it all boils down to them just being jealous of him. And, uh, and so this, attest, or this, this is a testament to also how hypocritical they are in telling this man to not move his pallet and using uh, Matthew 7, 4 through 5 as kind of a parallel um, of this hypocrisy. Um, it says in verse 4, Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clear, clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So in this instance, we can call the, the man moving his pallet as a speck. I mean, he's not doing anything wrong um, in the eyes of God because I mean, God himself, Christ, told him to pick up his pallet and walk. So he's doing what he's told. Um, but from the Pharisee's point of view, it's, it's a wrongdoing. Um, but that doesn't matter because of the, how, um, how hypocritical they're being and saying you can't do this when they have their own problems being jealous of God and ultimately wanting to kill God. They have their own problems that they need to work out before calling someone else out for doing something that, I mean, wasn't wrong. Um, which brings us to the third point, that they, they weren't only legalists or jealous, but they were bloodthirsty. They wanted to kill Jesus. And this goes back to the root of the second point, the, the jealousy that they had for Jesus because he had ultimate authority. He had power to heal just by speaking words of healing. Um, in a verse that, um, kind of ties us together in James 3, uh, 14 through 16, talking about the root of je- or talking about jealousy being the root of evil. It says, "But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing." I mean, we see, we see it here as an example. The Pharisees are jealous of God, and so they go to the extreme of wanting to kill him um, after persecuting him. Um, so it truly is the root of their problems that they have with, with Jesus. Um, but that brings us to our third point about Jesus. Um, because he has an ultimate authority and power, um, and the Pharisees don't like that, and they're jealous of that power, it's apparent that Jesus is king. So if you're looking, if you're taking notes, Jesus knows, Jesus commands, and Jesus is king. He has ultimate authority and power. And there's a similar situation like this in um, Mark 2, 23, verse 23 to 20, 28. You can turn there if you want, um, but I have it. Um, so starting in verse 23, it says, um, Hold on. It says, And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing What is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, Have you never read what David did while he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So here we have another, a similar example of um, the Pharisees persecuting Jesus for doing something that they thought was unfit during that time. Um, But it's illustrated clearly that he says, um, that doesn't matter because I have ultimate authority. I have ultimate power. Um, 
over these things. Um, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. That's what Jesus is saying. Um, so these things that they're doing are permissible. Um, so what the Pharisees have on these people is a binding legalism, uh, making it so they can't uh, do what they need or do what they um, do, do what they what Christ sees fit. Um, so we have Jesus knows, Jesus commands, and Jesus is ultimately he's king. He has ultimate authority and power. Um, so the parallel, um, we come to healing in our own lives. So we can compare ourselves as mankind um, to the paralytic. The paralytic is sick. Um, he's been sick his whole life, lame, unable to walk. And uh, it's a hard subject to talk about um, some, some groups. But the fact is that we were born into sin. We're ill with sin. It says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, there's a comma there, and it's, there's a second part that's important to tack on, but we'll be discussing that in a bit. But we're desperate, just like the man was. We're desperate for healing. We're desperate for spiritual healing. Uh, and when we are desperate, Jesus knows our afflictions. He knows the things we've been through. He knows our physical issues as well as our spiritual issues. The whole chapter of Psalm 139 is all about the Lord knowing us. It's a very comforting um, chapter in the book of Psalm. And if you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend you take a note and read it later, but it's all about God knowing us. It talks about Him knowing our thoughts, our actions, the words before they leave our lips, our bodies. He talks about Him uh, creating us in the womb and knowing us before we are even conceived. He knows, he knows us better than we know ourselves. The first verse of Psalm 139, uh, verse 1, sums it up. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. This is comforting. I find peace in this because the Lord knows me. The Lord knows you. This is very important. He knows you inside and out. And we can have hope in this. Uh, and where we have hope, He has mercy. Just like in this story, the, the paralytic, he had hope for healing and he had, um, he had been holding on to hope for almost 40 years and Jesus came and gave him that um, healing through grace and through mercy. And he showed his obedience and his faith and hope and faith are similar in definition. They're kind of like cousins or brother and sister. In Hebrews 11 and 1, it talks about um, faith and hope, and it kind of shows how similar they, they are. It says in verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So they're, they're pretty synonymous, and they're used interchangeably, but here it's saying that um, having faith in something, or having faith in the Lord, is being sure that the things that you don't see, or things that are to come, will happen, um, because you do have that faith in the Lord. And so, like the man being obedient and standing without question, um, just there in that moment, he had faith that he was healed and that he'd be able to walk. And this lesson is called Hope for Healing because hope is so important today. I mean, having hope in the right things, not just hope in general, but having hope in Christ. I mean, people have hope in the wrong, wrong things today. Um, and a, kind of a silly way to put it, um, is that there's a lot of coping and not enough hoping today. Let's say that again. There's a, there's a lot of coping, but not enough hoping um, today in, in our world. People are putting their hope in uh, money or their job or themselves, which is the biggest thing. Um, what can we do? Um, so putting your hope and faith and trust in the Lord is the best thing to do, even today. Um, and... As, as mankind progresses, that's the most important thing is to hold on to that hope. Um, and ultimately, holding on to hope shows obedience. And when we're obedient, we show faith. Um, and when we show faith, He heals. Always spiritually and physically when the Lord wills it. So praying for a physical and spiritual healing is what the Lord wants. And um, if you put your faith in the Lord, He will heal your heart and clear, and clean your soul. Um, and so continuing from the first verse that we talked about where we, we have this affliction that 
that God knows that we have, that Jesus knows. He knows we're ill with sin. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all we've sinned, fall short, glory to God. But there's that comma, and it's continued, saying in Romans 3.24-25, through 25, Being justified as a gift by His grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith, this was to de- demonstrate His righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. So the, the continuation of Romans 3.23 saying we're ill with sin, we have that, is that there's that healing for us that God sent down His only Son um, to die on the cross, shed His blood, and forgive us of those sins, and to heal us spiritually. So this is a promise that we can confide in and have hope in, hope of healing, that um, putting our faith in Christ, that God will heal us spiritually always. And we can have that now. Just like the paralytic, he put his hope and his faith in Christ, and he was healed. And this serves as an example to us how we should put our hope and our faith in Christ um, and be healed spiritually and maybe even physically if it is the Lord's will. Um, and we're promised that today. Lord, I just um, I thank you for this opportunity. Um, even if it is a, a shorter lesson, I just pray that um, the words that you've spoken through me um, will reside in the hearts um, of those here today. And I just thank you for those who came today. And I just ask that you bless them, Lord. Um, and as we sing these last couple songs, I just pray that they'll be able to put uh, put their hope in you, Lord, and just, just draw close to you. Just thank you so much, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy, for the ability for us to just to hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen.